Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Bud Churchwar, WB7 at HC, and we're going to be talking today about amateur radio repeaters. In particular, we're going to be talking about 220 megahertz repeaters. The 220 megahertz band has always been my favorite, and it's the only voice repeater that I monitor 24-7. So if you ever want to get a hold of me, you can always call me on the Mount Constitution 224-48 repeater. Yesterday, we had the monthly San Juan County Amateur Radio Society's uh, Zoom meeting. And at that meeting, an old friend of mine, Ken Coster, N7IPV, did a presentation about a network of 220 repeaters that has been put together here in the Puget Sound area of Western Washington. You'll find this very interesting. He starts with kind of a history of 220 in our area, and then he starts talking about how he links these together. He's created his own controllers. He's using Raspberry Pis, and many repeaters now can be linked together uh, using this system. I think you'll enjoy it. Let's watch. I first met our uh, featured presenter at a CPAC meeting and and met him through uh, through Peter. Uh, all of us have hams, you know, one of the decisions ultimately we have to make is how we're going to allocate our ham radio monies. And Peter long ago encouraged me to have a 220 megahertz radio. And uh, I've really been glad I did. And we're all going to find out one of the big advantages of uh, 220 megahertz from our featured presenter. He is retired. He retired from a career in uh, software development in embedded systems. He's worked for uh, Motorola and worked independently as an independent consultant. While he's kind of a trained hardware guy, he's uh, really strong in software and he's used his uh, professional background to create a phenomenally uh, powerful tool available to us in amateur radio called the uh, Pacific Northwest 220 megahertz repeater network. It's great to have him here so he can tell us a little bit about it. Uh, let's wave your hands to give a warm welcome to our featured presenter, Ken, N7IPP. Ken? Anyway, yeah, my name is Ken, N7IPB. Uh, I've been licensed since uh, 1971. So that puts it at uh, 50 some years. I, uh, I started getting into ham radio while I was in the military. Well, I actually got into it before that, but never got licensed. So I, uh, I finally got a license uh, uh, while I was in the service uh, teaching electronics for the Air Force in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, while I was there, I also got, uh, got interested in repeaters because there was a two meter repeater in the club station that was, uh, tubes remember those and it had no controller uh and lots of lots of things needed so i just got fascinated by it and uh, started started playing with uh, improving it got together with another uh, engineer there and uh, designed and built a a complete ttl based controller for it all hardwire and and uh Let's see. It was uh, wire wrap stuff, but uh, it was fun. I got I got hooked at that point. Um, I left the service, came back here, uh, went to work for a living. Uh, worked in telecom, test equipment, medical, all kinds of things, doing embedded systems work, uh, designing and uh, and working on on embedded computers. We'll, we'll do a little bit of history here of of the the two twenty system and uh, and how it came to be um, or how part of it the part I'm involved with came to be uh, but uh, and why I got into 220 first of all having played around with repeaters for many many years uh, finding a repeater frequency was not always the easy thing to do especially on two meters uh, 440 was okay you could but uh, I kind of got hooked on 220 starting in the what it would have been in the 80s, early 90s, when we had a, a 220 repeater on Gold Mountain that was used for packet. It was a packet repeater, uh, 1200 baud packet. 
and I like the performance of of 220 and how it uh, how it played. So um, somewhere in all that time period, there I met Peter WA7FUS and a whole bunch of other guys, and uh, I think it was uh, what have I got in my notes here? Uh, what was it 2000 and two or something like that and around that time frame uh we got got the opportunity to put a 220 machine up on lyman hill and uh i went forward and did that um uh, let's see here let's jump ahead here there's the 220 lyman machine being uh being built that's richard and seven rig who unfortunately is no longer with us uh peering through it it was a, a GE Master II and uh, eventually an NHRC controller. And uh, for those that like repeaters pictures, this is the, uh, the Lyman Hill site looking south, south, southwest slightly. And uh, you can see why we like that site. At some point in here, Peter and I got the opportunity to link the 220 system uh, with the system, the W7WRG system that K5IN and others ran. We wanted to link things in with that. This would have been an RF link at that time. So let's fast forward to 2015. Uh, this, is, uh, this is after we'd already had it up and running. We actually had it linked in. Initially, it was an in-band link on 220. No, actually, we first first it was an RF link on 440 linking us to the 220 system via the 440.5 repeater on Buck. Uh, then when Buck had to move down to Capitol Peak, I think we I think that's when we switched over to doing an in-band for a while. But eventually we moved antennas and uh, got it linked uh, over an RF link to the rest of the system. And the, the 220 system, uh, at that point, all the repeaters were linked on RF. They used the 440.5 repeater as the hub to talk to. It actually it worked very well. It was, uh, it, it was nice. We'd use that for a lot of years. But in 2015, by then I was living in Federal Way uh, after having lived uh, most of that time up in the Skagit County area and uh, in North, I was looking at improving things on the 7.8 machine, and I was thinking about software-based systems. Uh, as a digression, I had originally built my one of my first early controllers. I built a, a computer-controlled controller that I put on a repeater and remote base it was strictly a garage operation or sometimes in the back of my car, but I had the, uh, the repeater in there. I had a six meter remote base on it. I had a two meter remote base on it uh, and the repeater was on 440. That was software controlled, but it was a hand built microcontroller. Uh, it was an 8035 controller software that I wrote myself for it. That was the, that was my first taste of that kind of thing. But in 2015, you can look around and see there's a lot of other opportunities. And the Raspberry Pi was uh, was starting to be really big. And I started looking at all the various software that was there, took a look and found a couple of pieces. One was All Star Link, and the other was some software called SVX Link. Before I forget, if anybody does have questions and you want to pop in here at any time, go ahead and do it. I, I actually prefer that rather than saving to the end. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I started looking at, uh, at All Star. Actually, I looked at it long before 2015 and wasn't particularly happy with it as a choice for a number of reasons. Uh, I know it works well and a lot of people now use it especially. But at that time, the only thing I saw was software that ran on a, on a specific version of Linux that I wasn't familiar with. And also 
I like to be able to build stuff from scratch and it was difficult to do. And I just didn't feel the need at that time to, uh, to do it. In 2015, things were starting to change, but then I also stumbled across SVX Link. Um, SVX Link is software that is from uh, a guy in Europe, SM0SVX. And it started out as uh, an Echolink system. It was, it, this was his primary, primary purpose, but uh, he clearly had other ideas uh, with uh, some of the capabilities and stuff on it. And by 2015, it was being used uh, quite a bit in Europe for lots of repeaters and, uh, and people were, were loving it. Uh, there was an, another project online called Open Repeater. Their intent was to produce a, an image that you could load onto a Raspberry Pi with some hardware and a web-based interface for configuring it. That is still available. And it, it uses FixLink as the, the underlying system. I didn't use it <laughs> primarily because it, 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 its web interface was a little bit restrictive and I, want, I needed to do some special, special things with it uh, ultimately. So uh, I didn't use open repeater. I've not kept up with, with it for a basic repeater. It's, it works just great and it's still actively developed. I started digging around and figured out what I needed for an interface on it. So I built a, uh, a DIY interface of my own based on plans that I found on the internet. I took a portable repeater that Peter had, 224.2 portable repeater that we had been using at Seaside every year for many, many years. We would haul this along and it would give us a, a, a repeater that we could use locally uh, Peter would hang it off of his deck with an antenna uh, or what have you. And uh, we'd all use that as our, our local chat frequency. Uh, and it worked very, very well. But when I started dabbling with FixLink, I decided it was time to uh, convert it and use it as, as a, a test platform. With Peter's blessing, I took a USB dongle like this. You can still find instructions online on how to how to take these. These are like five bucks a piece, and you can tear into them. And with the addition of a, re, of a, a transistor and a resistor or two, and a little bit of work, you can turn this into a complete interface for a radio, uh, audio in, audio out, push to talk line, uh, which is what I did, and I coupled it to the 224.22 portable machine, and this is what you're looking at here. Um, there is the Raspberry Pi in the middle left. You can see the uh, interface card sticking out of the, the USB port on top of it. Um, that goes over and hooks into the radio system. And the Ethernet cable comes out to the outside world. By the spring of 2016, I had learned enough about SixLink and its configuration because it is different. It is not, it's not like buying an RC210 controller and going in and setting a few parameters and bingo, you've got a repeater. It's a little more complex than that, but it's also extremely flexible. It has the concept of logic blocks. These are configurations in a file that say, I want this to be a repeater block. I, in fact, I want two of them or three of them or four of them. Uh, you can do that. There's a simplex block for something that is used in a simplex mode on a radio that's half duplex. There are modules for echo link. There are modules for meteorological information from your web, from your uh, airports and, and the like. Lots of, lots of additional stuff. Oh, there's, I think there's even some stuff for uh, uh, band openings and stuff like that that I haven't used. There's a, there's a, a mail program on it. You can leave voicemail uh, and receive voicemail. Uh, all kinds of neat stuff. So I figured it all out well enough to get started on it anyway. By spring of 2016, I had the portable 2.2 machine configured. We were ready to give it a try and see how, it, how well it actually worked. Uh, at this point, by the way, there was no 
no internet connection to it. This was this was all done uh, locally, and the internet connection was primarily for just me controlling it and and going in and tweaking on it. So CPAC 2016. This is the setup at CPAC 2016. It grew a little. You can see in the bottom down there, you can see the, the 220 repeater. Sitting on top there is, on the right, is a, another Raspberry Pi. No, excuse me, that's just the, that's my, uh, that's my router. Um, and on top of that is a Raspberry Pi with another interface connected to it, a couple of cables to it, going over to a UHF radio on the, on the bottom left, power supply, and a 220 radio sitting on top of that. Overall, this made a repeater system that had 224.22 repeater. It had a simplex 224.78 port and a 434.910 UHF port, simplex. And anybody could use any of the frequencies and talk to everybody on the other ones. They were all linked together. That was CPAC that year. One other thing is I did at that point by then have added in a, uh, at the last minute, uh, an internet connection that connected back to another simplex system at my home QTH that linked us into the broader 220 network that was in the Puget Sound area. So we could, we could get on our handhelds at CPAC and chat with everybody. I had a blast. I think the other people did too, because we, we could do so much with it. it. It kept busy. At that point, I decided that I needed to make a new machine for uh, Lyman. And I wanted to build up a reliable controller for it. Uh, I wanted something that could survive the winter. I was looking at things like watchdog timers and, you know, you, you, you get a little concerned about putting a repeater at the top of a 4,300 foot hill that's snowed in for a number of months of the year. Uh, I didn't really want to have to go up and visit it. Uh, so I looked at building something that would be reliable. Uh, I put together a system and this is, this is going to talk to us. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead actually. Skipping ahead. I don't need to play the video of it. That was the back of the controller. This is the front of it with the touch screen on the front. And I played with that, getting ready to do uh, Lyman. This is the new Lyman uh, base repeater, receiver, and transmitter there on top. On the lower left is the link radio because we wanted to still link into all the other repeaters, which was at that time RF linking. But I determined that the controller with the touch panel was overkill. <laughs> Uh, you know, who's going to be up there to see it? It was fun to do, but not really necessary. And there were some reliability issues with all of the, the, the wires coming together. And I was using a, a standard sound card and some other hand wired stuff. I just didn't feel it was going to be reliable enough. So I went on to design a custom radio interface. Uh, I looked at some of the ones that were available. Uh, I looked at uh, uh, the UDRC at that time was, uh, I believe, yeah, that was just coming out. For various reasons, I decided none of them were going to do exactly what I wanted. I needed something that could handle two channels, one receive for the repeater and transmit for the repeater, and another one for the link radio receive and transmit. So I broke out program called KeyCAD and designed my own controller card. My goal was to have it ready by Seaside and its initial goal was to only cut down on the number of interconnections, uh, still use an existing sound card, but potentially have uh, its own sound card built into it. But I wasn't comfortable enough with my design and I wasn't sure enough that the sound interface, which is the ch big chip you see there on the, on the screen, uh, that I had wired it right. I didn't have a good example. 
I wired it up so that you could use it externally. And if it did play, I could test that part of it out. Well, lo and behold, it worked fine. I was amazed. So I redid the card. This time taking off the external connections and hooking it up and, uh, and getting it going. That was available in time for Seaside. Back, there it is. That's, that's a stack. It's got the Raspberry Pi on the bottom. It has a, uh, uh, a UPS board called the, UP, the Pico UPS that provides me with backup power, keeps the thing alive long enough for the, the, uh, the system to shut down gracefully if you lose power. Uh, and uh, it provides a, a few other functions too, like a, a one wire interface for temperature probes and uh, a relay control that I use to uh, turn, to, to bypass the amplifier that we have at Lyman and so forth. Let's see here. So we use that at CPAC. It was st installed in, in July of, uh, of uh, on July 21. We pulled out a Tate TV7100 that we had up there and put this whole system in place. There it is on the test bench. So that's what's, that's what's actually up at Lyman right now, 224.78. That was the first system in the link. We did have internet uh, through a local, a local, uh, local company commercial, not Hamwan. So I took that Tate home, put it on the bench, hooked up another unit I had there to it just for fun and had it working as a, as another repeater. When along came the opportunity to put something on gold mountain. So I built it into the, uh, the Tate and the second repeater joined the network. And that's 224.66. This is the inside of the Tate with the, uh, the Raspberry Pi, the UPS, the custom board, and, and all of the guts. So that, that went up. I had not planned on a second system. I, I wanted Lyman to be up a winter so I could determine whether was, this was all going to be reliable or not. But the opportunity was there, so we did it. Well, then along comes K5IN and says, you know, could you do one for Capital Peak on 440.5? So, yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, built and installed in mid-October. Remember, the first one went up in the middle of July, so we're moving fast. I was, I was sweating it just a little bit. Uh, this is the inside of the Capital Peak machine. Uh, on the left-hand side is an all-star node that's cross-coupled to the right-hand system, which is fixed link, uh, doing the re repeater controlling. The all-star node is a connection to uh, Hawaii. We survived the winter, and we grew. So then BAFA was added. I built a repeater for that, 224.08. We got a new linking method for linking the internet-connected machines. Let's see, June, I think it was, of 2020, I switched this over to using this new method and uh, an Amazon Web Service uh, server. And they introduced talk groups, which we'll get into. Three more repeaters were added <laughs> very rapidly last year. Baldi on 224.88. It got converted and added into the system. Rattlesnake, 224.58. That used to be on Haystack. There used to be a machine. There were problems at the Haystack site. I built a new machine and we put it on Rattlesnake with one of the new controllers. And then most recently, Blinn 224.1 is uh, was added to the system. So those are all the systems that are internet connected. Then we have things like Simplex Hotspots, which uh, I'll briefly get into later. This happens to be, uh, this is the controller for, uh, for Baldi uh, sitting there. Okay, let me jump ahead. I've got more slides in here than, than we need. The repeater, P pnw220.net. If you go there, you can see the dynamic system maps. And the map page will show you the location of all of the repeaters 
And if you mouse over uh, or click on one of the little towers, it will tell you everything about that particular site that you probably need to know. Frequencies, PLs, so forth. Uh, and you can see where they are. Uh, it also will show you in real time if the repeater is in use and transmitting and if it's in use in receiving something and give you an idea of what the received signal strength is by the size of a green circle around it. Um, on the website, there are dynamic graphs that are kept. Every five minutes, all of the repeaters are queried and graphs are made showing uh, disk space used and how busy the machine is, temperatures, uh, barometric pressure on many of the sites. Some of them have barometric pressure sensors, indoor and outdoor temperature, all the stuff that a, a data nerd like me would loves. Uh, another page in there has the receive signal strength, the RSSI page. Uh, it shows each individual receiver. And if you're talking, you can see a dynamic bar showing you how strong you are into the repeater. So if you're if you're testing things out, that's the place to go. Make sure you can you can see exactly how you're getting into all the different receivers. We've added some voting receivers. Uh, the Gold Mountain site was the first one uh, where I got the opportunity to put a second receiver. It happens to be at the Baldy site, but it provides an, a second 22466 receiver. Uh, for the, the Gold Mountain site. So if you're getting into both Gold and the Baldy receiver, you can see the difference between the two. One will be a green circle and one will be a yellow one. The yellow one is receiving but not being used. The green one is the one that's currently selected. So it, it tries to vote and determine which receiver is the one with the best signal strength for you. It's extremely easy to add voting receivers to uh, SfixLink. Uh, you don't need any additional hardware other than a radio, an antenna, and a Raspberry Pi, an interface. Uh, granted, yes, that is hardware, but it's not special hardware uh, outside the ordinary. There is a second receiver for Rattlesnake. Uh, it's also going to be located physically at, at Baldy. It's not been installed yet because we ran out of, uh, ran out of good weather to get up there and install the radio and hook it up to the Raspberry Pi that's up there. But uh, that will be added and other voting receivers as we determine the need. So I've got a, got a question for you that uh, from yep. someone who has gone to the web page. So one of the questions, Mount Constitution is not shown as part of the network. That is correct. The, the, the 220 network is just a specific set of machines. There's nothing. Nothing says Constitution couldn't add itself if it if it wants to, uh, you know, to to join the group. We're more than happy to do that, but it does require, you know, the appropriate controller and uh, and software. Um, I would love to teach more people how to use it and how to set it up and and join the system. Uh, is the uh, is the Pacific Northwest 220 network formally part of the Washington State? Um, emergency management plans um formally formerly formally no uh it is uh it is available for any of the groups that want to use it uh we we don't don't have any problems with groups that uh, that want to use it for emergency tests or uh, integrated into their plan uh, We'd like to have some input on it so that we know that it's happening and, uh, uh, you know, know who's doing what, when, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's available. We're not being restrictive. I, I should, I should go back a little bit here and the, a large part of the repeaters are all, uh, from, uh, Brian K five I N the only two repeaters in there that Peter and I own are gold and Lyman. Uh, but all the other repeaters are are owned by others. They've oh, just chosen to Lake Forest Park. Oh, Lake Forest Park. I'm sorry, Peter. I forgot. Uh, yeah, we added Lake Forest Park uh, here uh, a few months ago. So Peter's two two machine is permanently connected to it. Uh, <laughs> sorry okay, about and, that. 
Got another question for you here. Uh, this is from Basil. Uh, is your voting system just a Raspberry Pi running uh, SVX link? But, uh, and maybe you could give a sentence on what a voting system means for those of us that don't know what a voting system is. A voting system is, in the old days, it was a repeater that had a hardware panel that looked at multiple receivers. It, it measured the signal strength on the, on the repeaters, the receivers. They have multiple receivers at different physical locations, all on the same repeater frequency. It's, same on, it's on the input of the repeater, so you don't have to go to switching things around. But the hardware makes a decision as to which signal is the better quality, and that's the one it chooses to use for the transmitter. So as you moved around and went in and out of different re receivers, it would automatically switch and keep you on what it thought was the best one. To answer Basil's question, yes, it is just the Raspberry Pi and SVX link. Uh, it's a configuration op option in the system where you say, hey, I have a second receiver available to me. It happens to be internet connected. So you connect to it over the internet and you put it in a, a voting block in there and say, all right, here's, here's my receivers for the repeater and it's repeater A, B, C, and D. And the software does its magic to determine which one is which. Uh, it's actually measuring the, uh, essentially the signal to noise ratio, the quieting on the signal to determine which one is the one to choose. So it's, it's pretty, pretty simple to, uh, to do uh, once you have the hardware. Another question? Basil commented that he's using a voted system on Lopez using the all-star thin client. Right. Uh, hey, yeah. Hoop, can I jump in for a second? Do it. Uh, um, so, Ken, I'd like to replace that thin client because they don't make them anymore. And uh, with a, a Raspberry Pi and... Uh, and the SVX link, I think that's possible because like, you're already doing it. I think I could just ape what you're doing. Yeah, it's essentially what you do is at each receiver site, because they, generally they're remote receiver sites. And at each receiver site, you have a, uh, a, a single Raspberry Pi and a radio interface and an, an internet connection. And you set that up as uh, what we call a, a, a TRX basically a network connected receiver. You can have network connected transmitters too as an aside, but let's, let's keep with receivers. It's a, a network connected receiver. And the, at the repeater transmitter site, you tell it, I have these network connected receivers here, 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 and here. And it's all software configuration. I'm going to talk to you offline. We uh, for the for the All Star Link that we use, we have to have a pretty accurate time reference too. So, um, both our sites have a you know special GPS antenna and a and a pulse yeah. per second um, time reference. Yep, uh, and and I will admit that this fixed link thing doesn't do quite the same job of they're they're using the GPS time and everything else to make sure that when you switch that the audio is all in sync and. Uh, and various other things about it. I really can't tell the difference. <laughs> and and Sixlink doesn't doesn't really care. It's it's going to uh, it's going to just simply be getting the streams coming in and making the decision. So yeah, it doesn't need that extra hardware. Uh, a comment from Greg said, interesting presentation. I especially enjoyed the PCB photos. Uh, his question is, with the internet linking, how does the system respond to ISP failures? Thinking about the Cascadia quake scenario. Good point. Good point. The failure mode, in fact, we've gone through this several times. But we use Hamwan a lot for the connections, and they're still making that system kind of robust. Um, we had uh, a multi-day outage here recently on uh, Rattlesnake and another short one on the BAFA site. And what happens is when it loses the internet connection, you lose the linking, but the repeater doesn't care. It keeps, it keeps doing its job. It keeps responding to everything. Um, it, uh, it goes on as a standalone repeater. 
I haven't done it yet, but uh, eventually, time permitting, enough amateur time units and all that, uh, I want to make it announce it uh, that uh, that the internet has gone away, so that the local users know that they're not connected. But uh, yeah, it just simply drops back into a mode where it's just not linked. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm looking at the clock. Just a few more minutes. Um, let, let, let me add. I, I just thought of one thing. I should uh, should say on that too. Nothing says that you can't also set the site up to have an RF link. You can do an internet link most of the time, and you can have a fallback position that if uh, if the internet goes away and you still want to say link to some other system, you can do that. Lyman is that way right now. Um, it still can drop down and do an RF link. Uh, it's old school RF link if the connection goes away. Uh, it all depends on how much hardware you want to build. Interesting. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, any, uh, any final questions from anybody? You can use the chat or you can unmute and ask the question verbally. Uh, I'll point out too, we also have Nikolai, which is an RF link site uh, down in Oregon. Uh, they will be going to a six link controller, uh, hopefully this year sometime. Um, and other sites, who knows, you know, whatever, whatever is available. I do, I do need, if, if everybody's mind, give me another five minutes or less to talk about the talk groups. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Talk groups is a, is a new feature that people just don't understand because it's never been available on an analog system. You know, we've got talk groups and the like in DMR and, and, and the like, but th this is not the same. Uh, you know, DMR, the talk group is selected by you at your, at your radio and, and so forth. Uh, analog talk groups are, you tell the repeater that you want to go to a particular talk group and then the whole repeater shifts over to it. All the people on that repeater at that point in time are all over on this other talk group and they can participate in the conversation. One person does the switching and says, I want to go over there. Um, we have talk groups set up for each of the repeaters so you can actually go on and say, I want to talk just on this repeater or I want to talk just on this repeater and on 224.22. Um, there are talk groups set aside for that. They're all controlled with DTMF. The audio switching is done actually at the reflector, which is located somewhere in Oregon on an AWS server. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, talk groups, once you get your head around it, there's a lot of neat things you can do with it. You can haul everybody on a couple of repeaters off to their own talk group dynamically, just pick a number and make your own little network. And in the meantime, all the other repeaters are available for normal use. They just simply won't be linked to, to yours when, uh, when somebody uses it. So uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. We're still getting our head around it. It's all new since basically January of last year. Uh, was when it showed up in the software, and uh, it took me a while to get my head around it too. So that's a that's a feature that I have used the talk groups, and the way that I did it uh, when I I have two entries in my radio, uh, uh, just different uh, PL tones, and so I key up one PL tone if I want to come out on every repeater in the entire system and a different PL tone if I just want to come out on the local one. Right. The The system is currently set up so that uh, 1035 is the, the tone for almost all of the repeaters, except the UHF one, uh, which is 1109. And if you use those PLs, you're on the whole system. That's system wide. But I set everything all up with a 100 hertz home, tone. And if you come in on that, it tells it just this machine, just go on, you know, don't bring anybody else up, bring just this one up. You can always switch and change with, uh, with DTMF tones. Uh, you can get on and, and say, all right, let's, uh, let's add uh, uh, capital peak into the mix or what have you. But the basic stuff is those two tones. 
That's very cool. So and that fundamentally means that uh, up here in San Juan County, we can, I would, I can easily hit both Lyman and Blinn. And I would wager to say that everybody in the county could probably hit one or the other. And it, uh, for, uh, practically it means that by being able to get into one of those repeaters, we can talk to anybody in the greater Puget Sound that is also uh, listening on one of those uh, repeaters. That's true. That's true. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of nice because then you leave the rest of the system alone, <laughs> excuse me, for everyone else to use. Um, it, it just drops off the machines that you're using. It drops them off the network and leaves the rest alone. And you can see the effect of that on the map. You can see who's talking and not bringing up everything, for example. Interesting. That's fascinating. Uh, Ken, you might mention the control codes that are available to people that are on the website and they could read through it and just figure right. out. Right. There is, there is a page on the website that lists control codes that, that uh, we make public. Uh, people can request information about what's going on. You can set, you can, uh, you can drop into a, uh, a parrot mode and have it play back your audio so you can hear how you actually sound. Uh, you can uh, pull up the METAR inf uh, information reports from the weather, uh, from the uh, airports that we have. Um, and of course, there's a, a series of, of commands for manipulating the talk groups. Uh, you can actually go on, and if you're carrying on a conversation with somebody on uh, on a repeater, and they're on a different repeater, you can yank them away and move you and them, anybody on any active repeater, over to a different talk group and drop off of the rest of the system with the commands that are there. You can QSY <laughs> a different talk group. And, yeah. uh, and, and I'm, can, can I'm, yeah. And there's an echo I'm, node on there too. Go ahead, Oop, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just going to uh, observe the uh, what Ken has on the uh, the screen, which is that uh, is Ken. You're always interested in somebody that has seriously serious website skills and someone that might be able to help I, you. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not a web programmer. I've done lots of websites, but. I consider myself very much a hacker on that. And these websites make heavy use of some uh, uh, JavaScript. And uh, I will mention that if you bring up the, the map, for example, uh, you are immediately connecting your web page to all of the repeater sites to get that information. So if we had a lot of repeater, a lot of map users, uh, the, uh, the repeaters would all be getting hammered with lots of connections. And I know that that's not right, but uh, a manner of, of finding enough time and the skills to, uh, to change that. So yeah, it's, I, if anybody has some serious website skills, JavaScript especially, and some of that, I'd be happy to talk. <laughs> well, Ken, this is great. Uh, thank you so much for creating such a powerful resource available to us here in the Pacific Northwest. I've enjoyed using it, uh, enjoyed using it myself. Uh, it is, it is uh, pretty neat. And again, um, look in the chat for uh, the website link to the, uh, to the map. Uh, we are recording this video, so it will be available for viewing uh, later. And maybe we could, Elizabeth, maybe you could put the website there in the, uh, in the meeting minutes. Thank you so much. This is great. Okay, well, we're going to move on. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Yep, let's, uh, let's all, um, you know, move your mouse cursor around and find uh, the, uh, there's a little applause uh, reaction key. So why don't you do your, do a, everybody show an applause at the reaction key and give, uh, give Ken a little thank you and uh, appreciation for his uh, joining us today. I can't find my applause reaction key, so hey, Ken, thanks. <laughs> you know, actually, all the applause I need is the fact that everybody's pretty much still here. There you go. <laughs>